This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated streaming service showcasing exceptional films from all over the world. Get an entire month free right now by going to MUBI.com slash Entertain the Elk. The Landscape It's the shot most associated with the westerns of classical Hollywood. Deserts, mountains, tall grass, muscular men carrying guns, riding horses, and shooting each other. Native Americans harvesting and defending their land. Men, women, and children packing up everything they own in a stagecoach and searching for a new life. Battling the elements in the hope for a better future. This is the Western genre. It's pure Americana. But then came Italian director Sergio Leone. The landscape shots remained, but with them came a distinctive feature. The close-up. The one shot most associated with Leone's work. When Leone made his first western, A Fistful of Dollars, in 1964, everything changed. In his article, Euphoria and Liberating Laughter, The Cinema of Sergio Leone, film critic Adrian Martin wrote, It was like seeing the death throes of the Hollywood western, violently displaced, reinterpreted, and pulped to shreds in another country. Yet it also suggested birth, the birth of a new kind of cinema. The close-up served as a microscope for Leone to examine, dissect, and then reimagine one of Hollywood's most celebrated genres. Five of Sergio Leone's seven films were called spaghetti westerns, a term derived from the fact that these films were made in Europe, primarily by Italians and non-Americans. The films and their makers became known as disruptors. Spaghetti westerns poked holes in the American myth of the West, preferring anti-heroes instead of the more typical heroes played by actors like John Wayne, Jimmy Stewart, Henry Fonda, and Gary Cooper. And Leone's most famous anti-hero was The Man With No Name, played by Clint Eastwood. The Man With No Name is the figure at the center of A Fistful of Dollars, For A Few Dollars More, and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. The films known as Leone's Dollars Trilogy. These were the films that helped make Eastwood a star, and it's easy to see why. Leone's close-up perfectly captured Eastwood's handsome, suave, and pensive face. As the camera lingers on his eyes, we wonder, what is he thinking? What does he want? What is he going to do next? Early film theorists were fascinated by cinema's ability to bring the audience close to objects, people, and places, and in particular, the faces of stars. In his book, Mythologies, Roland Barth breaks down this slice of movie magic in his article, Garbo's Face. Greta Garbo still belongs to that moment in cinema when the apprehension of the human countenance plunged crowds into the greatest perturbation, where people literally lost themselves in the human image as if in a filter, when the face constituted a sort of absolute state of the flesh which one could neither attain nor abandon. It's easy to understand why close-ups of the face take such a hold of the audience. You don't get that kind of view at a concert or watching an actor on stage. It's the magic of the camera. The ability to see blood, sweat, and tears in a way that allows us to feel the emotions that play out across a character's face in a visceral way. In fact, we often get to see the person more closely than we would if we were standing right in front of them, as if they were under a magnifying glass for our complete and thorough examination. In that sense, the image transcends reality and becomes, as Barth says, something that one could neither attain nor abandon. It exists before our eyes, but we cannot touch it, or smell it, or talk back. We are forced to sit back and stare at the image as it's presented to us. That kind of intimacy is one thing that cinema gives us that few other art forms can. So why does Leone opt for the close-up? What makes the shot such an effective and powerful visual choice? Well, before we get more philosophical, let's start with a quick analysis of what the close-up is and how Leone used it. Here's the final scene of Leone's epic, Once Upon a Time in the West. Harmonica, played by Charles Bronson, has spent years chasing one man, Frank, played by Henry Fonda. When Harmonica was a boy, Frank killed his brother in the most gruesome and horrific way imaginable. And Harmonica, understandably, wants revenge. We don't know these details until the final shootout, when Leone zooms in on Harmonica's face and cuts to a flashback. Of course, we see the hatred play out on Harmonica's face, but there's more than just that. In his eyes and the lines on his face, we get a sense of history, of age, of all that he has endured and what has transpired since that fateful day. 
No words or explanations are needed. Lesser directors may opt for a long monologue at this climactic moment, but not Leone. The poetic ambiguity of its close-up says more about what Harmonica is wishing, feeling, and thinking in this moment than dialogue ever could. Now let's go back to Eastwood. Leone shows us the man with no-name's face in various close-ups throughout the early moments of A Fistful of Dollars, and Leone has him do things a typical Western hero would do. When we first see him, we watch contempt play out across his face as a group of villains assault a father in front of his son. He drinks, he smokes, and he gets himself out of tricky situations with the precision of his gun. That's what we've come to expect our Western heroes to do. But there's something different about Eastwood's character. He's not the conventional hero, and there's something about his face that suggests a different, darker side. Ironically, it's the film's antagonist, Ramon Rojo, who first points this out. After meeting the man with no name for the first time, he says, I don't like that Americano. He's too smart to be just a hired fighter. When someone with that face works with his gun, you may count on two things. He's fast on the trigger, but he's also intelligent. That makes him too dangerous for you, I think, my brother. The man with no name is certainly not someone you can trust. He's both a hero and a villain. Sometimes he's a criminal, other times he's a bounty hunter. He's willing to kill, steal, torture, and do things that the typical hero wouldn't do. Leone disrupts the conventional heroes of the West to reveal the dark underbelly of it all. There is no good without the bad and ugly. There are moments when Eastwood's handsome face seems to resemble that classic hero, but there are times when Leone even disrupts this by literally damaging Eastwood's face. Throughout the Dollars trilogy, his face often takes a beating, and Leone's not afraid to show us in full effect. In A Fistful of Dollars, his face is badly cut and bruised after the villains capture and torture him, and in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, his face becomes deeply burned and chapped after Tuco, aka The Ugly, forces him to crawl through the desert. It's far from the perfectly lit and kept face of John Wayne at the beginning of John Ford's stagecoach. Hold it! Steady, ho, ho. In an essay called The Face of Man, film theorist Bella Balaz wrote that when a director cuts to a close-up of the face, the viewer loses all reference to space when we see not a figure of flesh and bone, but an expression. For feelings, emotions, moods, intentions, thoughts are not themselves things pertaining to space, even if they are rendered visible by means which are. And so when Leone cuts to Eastwood's mutilated face, we see something more than our anti-hero struggling to survive. We see the expression of a director attacking and upending a storied genre, and revealing a brutality that's always lingered just below its surface. We see this play out in a different way in Leone's 1971 film, Duck, You Sucker, the film is set in Mexico in the 1910s during the Mexican Revolution. The film follows a pair of anti-heroes Juan Miranda, a notorious Mexican criminal, and Sean Mallory, a wanted Irish revolutionary and demolition expert. The film is a hilarious and dark political satire that follows the two men as they accidentally become heroes in the revolution while planning a large crime. The film opens with a great scene in which Juan and his team of bandits rob a luxury stagecoach filled with the worst kinds of rich people. Everything from the clothes they wear to the tea they drink and the books they read is pretentious. Juan tricks them into letting him aboard by pretending to be a hitchhiker. The passengers eat, drink, and hurl insulting questions and profanities at him. You know how many kids you have, huh? Eh? <laughs> he doesn't know anything, you see? Because that's what they are. Animals. Leone pairs their revolting language and behavior with equally revolting shots. In a series of extreme close-ups, Leone brings us to their mouths and beady eyes and shows them drinking and eating with a level of gluttony that would make even the most sinful man blush. In these close-ups, Leone is again upending more idyllic tellings of white people settling the West, and instead shows us racist, shameless colonizers. While classical Hollywood may have focused on tales like the shootout at the OK Corral or the Alamo, Leone opts for something else, a darker, truer portrait of the people who exploited others for their own wealth and material gain. And he does so not with some grandiose scene, but with some nasty chewing. In an essay called The Close-Up, Balaz writes, 
The camera has uncovered the cell life of the viral issues in which all great events are ultimately conceived. For the greatest landslide is only the aggregate of the movements of single particles. A multitude of close-ups can show us the very instant in which the general is transformed into the particular. The close-up not only widened our vision of life, it has also deepened it. In the days of the silent film, it not only revealed things, but showed us the meaning of the old. Is there a better way to describe the essence of Leone cinema? Sure, there's still the beautiful landscape shots and the elaborate shootouts we have come to expect with the Western genre. But with his close-ups and extreme close-ups, he not only gives us a new kind of Western and a new way of seeing, but a new way of watching, understanding, honoring, and even critiquing that which came before it. That is Leone's genius, and in many ways, the essence of art. Now, let's pivot away from the spaghetti westerns towards Once Upon a Time in America, Leone's final film. Once Upon a Time in America is a gangster epic set mostly in the early part of the 20th century in New York City. The film centers on a pair of best friends, Noodles, played by Robert De Niro, and Max, played by James Woods. The film is an epic in every sense of the word, and depending on the cut you're watching, is well over three and a half hours long. But I only want to focus on one shot, and it's the final shot of both the film and Leone's career, a close-up. By the time one encounters this shot, we have just watched hours of film, witnessed decades of time gone by, seen men and women beaten and killed, empires rise and fall, and dreams crash and burn. The film, if one had to distill it to a single premise, is Leone's deconstruction of the American dream. The film begins with Noodles entering an opium den, and then learning that his three best friends have been killed by the police. The film then continues from there, taking us back to the group's days on the streets as teenagers, up through the time when they ran one of the most successful speakeasies in all of Brooklyn. It's their version of the American dream. Leone returns to this opium den at the end of the film as a kind of epilogue. While there, we see Noodles take a long drag, lay back, and begin to laugh. The image stills, and then fades to black. The film, and thus Leone's career, comes to a close on his signature shot. Beneath the drugs, there is truth. And what might that truth be? Who knows? And frankly, it doesn't really matter. Therein lies the power of the close-up. Ambiguity. With a simple shot, Leone undermines our entire way of viewing his film. With each new viewing, we might see something different in a character's face, in gestures, a glance, or a smirk. For Leone, that ambiguity is subversive, a way to probe the infinite dimensions of American life under his signature magnifying glass of a shot. A lot of excellent films have been lost in the shuffle recently with the pandemic and canceled film festivals. Films like Beginning and What Do We See When We Look at the Sky that absolutely deserve your attention. And right now, you can watch these films on MUBI. MUBI is a curated streaming service that houses beautiful, interesting, and incredible films from all over the world. Every day, MUBI premieres a new film that has been hand-selected for you. Think of it like your own personal film festival streaming anytime, anywhere. MUBI is giving my viewers a 30-day free trial, so go to MUBI.com slash Entertain the Elk so you can see everything they have to offer at zero risk to your wallet and start enjoying amazing films right now. Thanks everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it and share it with a friend. And leave me a comment below. Tell me what's your favorite Western movie of all time. This is my reminder to you all to make sure you're subscribed, but also make sure you click that bell below. I've had so many comments recently from subscribers who are frustrated that YouTube isn't sharing my videos with them. And believe me, it frustrates the hell out of me too. So if you're subscribed to this channel and you don't ever want to miss one of my new videos, then make sure you click that bell below. That's the only way to make sure that you're notified whenever a new video comes out. I'm about to welcome my second baby in a few weeks, so this might be my last video for a while, but I'll be back as soon as I can with some more interesting and thought-provoking videos for you. Thanks again everyone for watching, and shout out to all my patrons out there for their continued support of the channel, and I will see you all next time.